It's John Lee, the current champ. He's never been defeated. Those awesome records, including the fastest kill. He killed a guy during the last Kumite. Yep, kicked the poor bastard right in the throat. I died right there on the platform. Chong Lee stood there and watched him die. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. One of the things that we've talked here on the channel, and I, I imagine most comic book readers have noticed over the last decade, maybe even a little bit longer than that, is the decompression, the decompressed nature of comic book storytelling. And you would think that this would um, really open the doors to add in more subplots and really tie a lot of things together. But that really hasn't been the case for the most part throughout comic books. And here to talk to me about that is the Marvel aficionado himself. Doc, how you doing? I'm great, man. Um, I love this topic. I know you've been you've been wanting to do this for a few weeks. We finally have a little bit of time to talk about this. And, uh, you know, it, it's weird. You know, Brian Michael Bendis brought in the writing for the trade style. You know, maybe some other people were doing it about the same time. But it's really become the norm across comic books. When you read something like Shadow Man right now, where every issue he fights a main villain, defeats them, and then the subplots are carrying the story through, it feels shocking. It's refreshing when you get something like that. Or when you read even uh, Nick Spencer's Amazing Spider-Man. A lot of yeah. subplots going through that comic book. And that's one of the reasons I think that it's, it's been pretty exciting to uh, to read that, that comic story. But for the most part, you get these really boring, decompressed story arcs. And you would think, wow, with all this extra extra space and all this extra time to to add in new information and really carry the series through into this big climactic moment they're not really doing that it's just really slow boring storytelling and they've all but cut out subplots for the most part you're you're correct um look the decompressed storytelling you know the purpose of that is so that it fits every story regardless of how much meat there is to it is five or six issues you know a, a, it doesn't matter if a story only really needs one issue um to, to, to be told, it will be padded out to five. It, it doesn't matter if a story really needs four issues, it will be padded out to six uh, because they want to be able to sell that collected edition. The problem is, you know, with all that extra space, you would, yeah, you would think that they'd use all that space to add some subplots, give, you know, give a... You know some teases of what's going to be coming down the line. Beef set up, up a future a supporting character, make you like him a little bit more. Yes, yeah, set up a future storyline right. somewhere. Uh, the problem is those are bad for trades, actually, because they don't wrap they, up in the one trade. Exactly, they don't wrap up in that trade, um, and 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 it requires you to read the trades in order. Um, that's the one thing that, for the most part, um, the right for trade, the format kind of creates, it creates a situation where you can essentially read most of those stories out of order. You can pick up a trade of this or that or whatever else, and it doesn't actually matter what order you read them in because there's no real, you know, it's like, it's like watching an episode of the Simpsons out of order. Um, you can watch pretty much anything from like season 10 through 20 in whatever order you want. And it doesn't matter because there's no, you know, with very few exceptions, um, no real through line through that. And the subplots create a through line. It creates a, a degree of continuity a happens before B happens before C, and it builds up to event D down the line. And so the, 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 the right for the trade, you lose, you know, some of the appeal to that. Now, if you go into the store, like the, the non-reader goes into the store and just grabs a random trade off the, off the shelf, they're like, okay, well, what, what, What's this whole subplot thing here? Where does that finish up? Then they go to the store again and buy a different trade. And it's it could be three stories after or two stories before, and they don't know. And they get confused. So especially since Marvel's trade program, you know, unlike manga, um, you know, where it's volume one through like volume 
907 in order. They don't do that. It's it's hard to collect them. I mean, especially considering that so much of the stuff from years past didn't have any sort of cohesion to it. Uh, it didn't have any formatting that was written with that in mind. It was difficult to collect. Yeah, I mean, you had the Dark Phoenix saga. Like, technically, it's like 30, is it 30 36, issues? Yeah, 37, I guess you could say, maybe 38. Uh, where the, where the start, idea is first introduced and then it's finally paid off, like three yeah. years. So it's it's essentially an omnibus worth. But some of those stories in there can be told in whatever order you want, but other ones need to be told in order. Um, and if you go and grab a, you know, just... You, know, you, you could break that up into three trade paperbacks or four trade paperbacks of nine issues, 10 issues each. Um, and they'd sell, and you could definitely number them one through four. But what happens with, and then you stick in, then there's one filler issue after that before you get to the Days of Future Past trade. You're not going to stick that one Wendigo issue or the one or two Wendigo issues in with the days of future past because it doesn't make sense. You're not going to stick it in with the, um, the, the, the dark Phoenix because it doesn't make sense, but you can't collect two issues into a trade. So well, also what do you do? Kind of big, brings up a bigger problem than just, you know, the, the way the trades are formatted and, and how the story is being released, which, okay, they had to work for it back in the day. Yeah. You know, them being the editors and, and the marketing team that are putting these things together. Cry me a river. That's your job. Yep. <laughs> but what it really speaks to, Doc, is the lack of like job security. Why would I why would I plan for future events happening 30 issues from now if I don't know that I'm gonna be writing this comic in six issues? I just That's, have to tell the this story and this story and this story, and then, oh I got more time and then and then and then. And, and that's why you don't get this really good cohesion where everything flows naturally into, into these crescendos where you finally get this payoff. And now this subplot is the one that takes over as the primary plot. And then you crescendo again and, and you know, it takes you down and, and gets you excited for the next story arc. You just get story, 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 just like, you know, with the with the event schedule. It's event, 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 event. You know, they all lead into each other now because there's no long term planning. They're only planning for the next month. Correct. They're essentially writing all these story arcs like they were out of continuity miniseries. Like their um, jobs depend on it. Yeah. And, and that out of continuity miniseries, if it sells, you get another six issue out of continuity miniseries, except for they're being done in the main book. And, and the problem you have with this is, yeah, twofold. Why would the creators um, really want to plot stuff that they don't know if they're going to be around to explore. And they don't necessarily want somebody else to explore the things that they're adding in there. I mean, that's the whole point of it. They want to, they have an idea, they want to explore it and they want to bring it to fruition. They want, don't want to just throw it in there and have somebody else that whoever, you know, one or two or three writers later explore it. Um, and then they don't want to also leave it there unexplored. I mean, for all of the things that, you know, looking back at like long runs from like John Byrne on Fantastic Four or Chris Claremont on X-Men, there were a lot of unexplored dangling plot threads that are still out there to this day that now maybe it's too late to really explore some of them, but they're doing it in the X-Men Legends series. If they did a Fantastic Four Legends series, they could probably explore a lot there. Um why leave them out there, especially if they never get explored? And the the readers are going to be disappointed by that. You know, you start setting something up and then you never really finish it off. And the person that comes in after you, all they do, you know, you've seen it every time a new writer comes on. They just essentially. It's a new character. Yeah, nothing it's, happened it's, before. <laughs> exactly, they just reset the clock back to default, and or, or have some major event happen in their first issue to essentially wipe out all of the existing subplots and stuff that's going on, so that they can set that character up to go in the direction they want. And now you again, know what's interesting. Nothing's, nothing's I, I, I don't want to interrupt here, but we there are a couple examples that I think 
probably prove at least to Marvel. I, I spoke of one Nick Spencer on Spider Man, but you think about Donny Cates' Venom series, right? Yep. This wrapped up thirty five issues, not the longest run in the world, but three years, you know, is is uh, significant nowadays. You know, within comic books, correct. And think about what they were able to get without get with that three year run where he was doing subplots, he was introducing ideas, he was introducing concepts. And then if he wasn't going to fully explore them in his Venom series, he had that web of Venom, you know, one shots where he was letting other art or other creators go and fill in those blanks. Venom sold great. And yeah. they got two major events out of it, although I was disappointed in Absolute Carnage because it was a prelude to another event. But they got two very high selling events out of it. And you got these other ancillary issues that sold well on their own as well. And got some notoriety for some talent and gave them an opportunity to showcase themselves and maybe start building a name for themselves. There's a lot to gain to having these nice, longer, sweeping arcs where you can actually build to an event. And it's not just out of thin air like Empire or out of thin air like Age of X-Men. You know, he built to King and Black for three years. It felt important when they finally, uh, you know, finally executed it. Absolutely. Um, you know, in addition, it caused gains in sales as time went on um you know because people saw there's something happening here there's there's um and they're invested new in the characters story. the story's yeah, not over yet i gotta yes. come back and finish the story exactly there's 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 a fomo there with your fearing missing out even even after the arc that you're in is finishing but wait, the three subplots that he was setting What's up What's going on with Dylan? Why was he able to do that? Yeah. Now you're like, well, we finished this absolute carnage thing, but now I got to find out about the Dylan thing that they set up, you know, before and then started crescendoing during this event. And now it's going to come to the afterwards and you're going to find out more of what's going on there. Plus now... Eddie doesn't have his symbiote or symbiote's brain dead and this and that. And, and you're like, okay, how does he get out of this? How did, how does all this work? Oh, and there's another new symbiote here um, that's in his dead ex-girlfriend's body from, but oh, wait, from a different universe. You know, you're always introducing something that makes people not want to leave. And as a result, you end up actually gaining readers because people that didn't jump on at the beginning start coming in and going, oh, wow, all these people are, are getting the payoffs that they wanted and they're getting new ideas that are keeping them sticking around. Um, now, so juxtapose that, Doc, to Donny Kate's Guardians of the Galaxy. That lasted 12 issues, which in today's Marvel comics is actually kind of substantial. Yeah, there's three story arcs and they're each contained as if they were written for the trades. Not a lot of subplots carrying through them. The sales never got big. No, it, it was it's it's built for a trade. It's perfectly fine. That's what I would. I, that's what I would describe. Donny Kate's Guardians of the Galaxy. It is. I mean, I, I, I didn't read it. Uh, I mean, I think I read a couple issues of it. Uh, I didn't read the whole thing. It didn't seem like he really had anything major to say on the character, and he could just swap it out for whatever other book he wanted to do at any time. He could, you could read that, you know, those stories basically in whatever order you wanted. Um, nothing, nothing really mattered there. There was, there was no long game. There was no real game being played. It was just, okay, well, I got this little story to tell. Okay, well, I guess I'll write this little story. Okay, you're going to give me another four issues. I'll write this little story. Um, and, and, and it's nothing important, nothing major, nothing interesting. Um, and sales never really came. Um, you know, Thor... It, it did well, but it never got into that top five list where you have, uh, you know, obviously Venom was there with, under Donny Cates. Thor has ascended up into there. But you can see he's doing a lot of things with Thor. Since the very first issue, he's been seeing that Mjolnir is getting heavier and heavier. Yeah. Guess what? We're pretty significant into the run, and he can almost not pick it up anymore. Yeah. He's been going through the entire time. Yes. And that's a long-running subplot. that, And now it's becoming much more of the A-plot. 
you know, we've talked, I know we've talked in the past about like A plots and B plots and C plots. You know, the A plot is the, the whatever that story arc is. It could be um, Spider-Man fighting the, the Sinister Six or stopping uh, Mysterio from robbing a bank or um, stopping, you know, the, that hunted storyline with, you know, Craven in all the animal themed villains in a, in the central park, Wh whatever with arcade. Um, that's the a plot, but the B plot is the stuff that that's going on behind there. The um, MJ Peter relationship. What's going yes. on? And then the C He's plot. lying to him. Is he going to find out? Yeah. And the C plot is the stuff that's happening way far away, but is, you know, is eventually going to cause a collision course. Kindred's uh, been here. We haven't seen him in a couple of months. Is, are we going to see Kindred again? Yes. Exactly. And now that those, the A plots are what get you the sales that month. The B plots are what get you the sales next month. And the C plots are what you get you the sales next year. Because people get invested in them. As they're also the things that make your run legendary. It does. You don't get a run that, that people go, you know what, that's one of the best, you know, uh, you know, Superman runs of all time. And then you're like, well, every single, you know, story is self-contained and there's no subplots to it. Now, there are there are times when they did that and they're, they're enjoyable, but you can't go, man, that was an amazing arc. Yeah, you can remember. Great run. Yeah, like, I mean? you know, we'll have like, um, I, I know that, you know, you've had Joe Corolla on here and Perch and they talk about like one random issue of, uh, you know, Captain America annual or an issue of Marvel team up or Marvel two in one. And those individual issues might be great, but they, there's a reason why anthologies don't really sell long term. And it's because there's no through line. There's nothing to keep you coming back on a monthly basis. Uh, yes. Spider-Man was always there in Marvel team up. Uh, the thing was always there in Marvel two in one. Uh, but you know, that, long running plot line um you know marvel comics presents was kind of just like you get short stories of wolverine in it but you also got a bunch of other stuff that nobody really cared about uh um, we, we got weapon x you know yeah, within that, uh, you know some of a of an anthology but everyone remembers that it's every like the damn the, story yeah because <laughs> it was 12 issues with you know eight pages per issue or something like that of a 96 page story or you know a hundred page story Obviously whatever that one's not really subplots and everything but you no. know, you're able to keep, keep keep people coming back because you have a nice engaging story and you know that this is going to last a little while yeah but nobody else remembers any of the other you know issues of marvel comics presents i mean you might remember a random issue here or there but after that the sales went back to where it had been before, which was were kind of middling, and it managed to stick around for a hundred issues in an era where a hundred issues, hundred and fifty issues weren't bad. That was about par for the course. That was that was your just kind of baseline comic. Um, and but you know, same with Marvel Two and One, same with Marvel Team Up. Um, but people remember Chris Claremont's X Men because it was seventeen years. And, you know, Chris would talk about how he would run out of, he would think he was running out of ideas. And then one of his, uh, you know, editors or one of his friends or one of his coworkers would be like, well, what about that thing you were talking about six issues ago between Moira and Prote or, you know, Polaris with Polaris getting bigger, but losing her magnetic powers. Oh yeah, I guess I can do something with that. And then there's the next three issues and he's already introducing six or seven other subplots that end up paying off 10 years down the line, two years down the line, six months down the line. It didn't matter how long it took for them to pay off. And that you know what else thing, Chris Claremont did? He gave you a little palate cleanser, a little one shot here and there. So yes. You need that too. He that, did. That, that helps build the, the run. It does. And, and you know what? Even Nick Spencer's Spider-Man has given us those palate cleanser issues from time to time. Uh, now, they even might, then, you can reintroduce that D plot that you haven't talked about in a year. Yeah. Hey, I'm still here. Why are yeah, you playing baseball? Yeah. You can have P 
Peter, uh, you know, tr realizing, oh shit, I haven't been going to my actual real job and they're going to fire me. Um, and, you know, that's the A plot and that's, that's perfectly fine A plot, but the D plot gets half the issue to advance so that six issues from now, two story arcs, three story arcs from now, it can turn into the big thing. Like you'd have, I mean, hell, you saw it at the end of all those issues where just, you know, Kindred would show up and recruit another member of the Sinister Six yep. for for Doc Ock's Sinister Six. And now we're getting to Sinister War, and holy crap, he's been kind of putting these six-issue, six-member teams together throughout this entire arc. And now we're getting a payoff of all of those six-member, you know, variations of the Sinister Six as going to war with one another. And it's basically Spider-Man versus the Sinister 36. Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's important great. stuff, Doc. It's, it's kind of, it makes you know, really jumping into a run and investing on it difficult. You yeah. never know how long they're going to last. And, you know, there's reading things in four issue arcs just isn't as, as exciting and as invigorating as, as engaging as these nice long arcing threads that really keep you coming back, champing at the bit wanting more. It does. Um, you know, when you start coming into these, you start getting invested into them and you start reading forward obviously because you want to see where these these subplots and and a plots b plots c plots d plots are going but it also gives you the urgency to read backwards and it, it you give the desire to figure out how the a plot that's going on right now became that a plot if it was a D plot or a B plot or a C plot in the past, and you go back and you start reading like the metamorphosis of it, you want to see how that thing became the butterfly you're reading right now and what kind of caterpillar it started as. And then what it grows into after that, if it turns into goddamn Mothra or if it just kind of burns out. Um, and it gives you the urges, you know, you have a reason to continue reading. You have a fear of missing out, of leaving if you stop, which you lose with these little, you know, one and done, um, you know, six issue, read it in any order you want mini series masquerading as six issues of a regular series. Absolutely. Well, Doc, I do want to say thank you very much. This is a fun conversation. We definitely want to hear from the from the viewers. What do you guys think about subplots? Is it, is it a lost art? Do you miss them? Because we, for the most part, do. You get them here and there, and they always feel special, but we don't get them enough. 